Please be seated and good morning to you all. Welcome to Fellowship Congregational United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming faith community dedicated to growing in spirit and working for justice. Uh, my name is Chris Moore. I uh, haven't been here in a while, so I thought I might <laughs> introduce myself. Good morning, everyone. Yes. Uh, if this is your first time here uh, or you have been here for years, welcome to church. We have some very special celebrations on this uh, special day to open our worship with. So if you will bear with us as we do some very fun things like join some new members. Um, always a good thing. So uh, I'm going to invite you as I read your short uh, bio uh, to please come forward and to, uh, to stand up here, uh, kind of like between here and, and about here. So somewhere in that area, right in there. Okay. Uh, Greg and Jill Taylor. Uh, Jill teaches math uh, for Tulsa Community College, and Greg is a residential builder for Taylor Homes. Uh, together they serve on two nonprofit boards, Every Nation Mission Foundation and the 1256 Movement. 1256 tries to bring love and healing to black families through reparative payments to increase home ownership and generational wealth. Uh, Jill is working on her doctorate in math education at Oklahoma State University, and Greg completed his Doctor of Ministry at Phillips Theological Seminary. You get applause just for that at things like this. <laughs> uh, Greg and Jill are married with three adult children, two in-laws, and a grandson named Samuel Ross Taylor. Not just a little bit proud of Samuel Ross Taylor. <laughs> Jill enjoys watching sports and traveling to conduct AP math workshops for the College Board. And Greg enjoys international movies and recently restored a 100-year-old house with lots of Jill's design direction. They'll, <laughs> they'll travel together to Honduras this summer to visit a hospital Every Nation Mission Foundation supports. Kathy Swain. Did I see Kathy this morning? So Kathy is recovering from some surgery. I don't know if she was going to be able to make it. So Kathy was born and raised here in Tulsa and married her husband Walt in 1968. They bought a house on 26th Place off Florence Avenue in 1969 and has, they have lived there for... Oh no, you stay up here. <laughs> stay up here the whole time. Uh, so Kathy loves to garden and read and quilt and do art, and I'm sure will be with us as soon as she gets some better recovery in. Uh, Jen and Stephanie Campbell. Stephanie Campbell was born and raised in Florida. She has family in Oklahoma and moved here in 2009. Stephanie met Jen Campbell, who is from Oklahoma, in August of 2013, and they married on October of 2014. They have four children, three boys and one girl. Stephanie works at Amazon, and Jen is retired, and their favorite thing to do, and I had to look this up on Google, their favorite thing to do is play Lattice Hawaii, which is a strategy board game where Jen usually lets Stephanie win. <laughs> That's what my notes say. Uh, right, I figured there would be some discrepancy with that. Stephen and Ariana Place. I just walked, oh, right there in front. Stephen and Ariana are no strangers to fellowship. They were, in fact, married here. Uh, those lights that are strung up across the ceiling of our fellowship hall, Stephen did that. And I told him, uh, yes, thank you, Stephen. I told him he could put them up as long as they stayed up. Uh, Stephen runs Second Wind Bicycles, and if you need a bicycle mechanic, that's who I use. Uh, Ariana is a teacher at Emerson Elementary and is also currently working on a master's in counseling. Starts her internship this summer, correct? And they are parents of Julian and Evelyn. Yes. Uh, Mace and Michelle. Did I see Mace and Michelle? Oh, hey, there you are. Uh, come on up. Mace is a student at Union and TCC consecutively, uh, but also works part-time at Cinemark. You guys can come over here. 
Mace, uh, in responding quite dutifully to the questionnaire, said that they are single with no children (laughs) because they are 17. Uh, Mace enjoys painting, uh, habitually it says, habitually painting. Mace's mother, uh, Michelle Peckham, works at her own business called Oak Tree Produce. She's divorced with three kids, Gavin, 23, Jonathan, 18, and Mace, 17, and loves to garden in her free time. Uh, Molly Rogers. Is Molly here? Molly, come on up. Molly, I didn't get bio information from you, so y'all are just going to have to talk to Molly (laughs) and find out all the things that you want to know about Molly, okay? There's Molly. Afterwards, find her. Uh, Anyone else want to join while the joining is good? We have some space up here. You want to join? Joe, come on up. Joe and Molly can just stand together and you all can talk to Joe and Molly and find out all about them. Okay, perfect. So now we start this uh, little tradition. You didn't know before you said you would join that you have to take a pledge. (laughs) No, no, it's too late now. Too late now. You're already up here. Friends, will you, the new members of Fellowship UCC, our co-conspirators in this adventure of Jesus following, pledge of your time and your talents and your resources to support the life and work of Fellowship Congregational United Church of Christ, if so say we will. Will you strive to make fellowship a place of radical hospitality? Will you read and faithfully engage with scripture and tradition? Will you cultivate your own spiritual gifts and share of your resources to the development of this community? Will you strive to live as Jesus taught, reaching across divides together as we work to build a kingdom of justice and love and dignity in the world? If so, say we will. will. Now, your turn, because this is the way that covenants work. There's two sides. So, congregation and friends of fellowship, will you repeat after me? Or with me, not after me, but with me. You know how this works. We, the members and friends of Fellowship Congregational United Church of Christ, joyfully express our welcome to you and affirm our mutual ministry. We covenant with you to work together as disciples of Jesus the Christ in the places which God calls us to, growing in spirit and working for justice. We promise to strive with you for healthy relationship, to reach for wholeness and community, and to treat one another with respect and dignity. Together, we continue building the beloved community, the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus, the one we call Christ, welcome. And I'm going to invite um, the ministerial staff and our a moderator, church moderator. This is a, a, a tradition that goes back. We just, it's just the passing of the right hand of fellowship. It's just a handshake. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Welcome, Molly. <laughs> Welcome. Mace. Welcome. Jill. Greg. Welcome. 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 Now you can, we, we do have some new member packets for you that uh, Pastor JD, they're sitting right there. You just passed them, right? So as you all head back to your seats, um, grab a new member packet as you head back, okay? Thank you. New members are always a 
a very welcome time of transition, a sign of growth and development for us. And another sign of this is watching our youth and our adults who are among us making transitions in their education. This is that time of year, after all. Uh, So before we begin worship, we'll also take a moment to celebrate some transitions and some endpoints and some new beginnings. Uh, For some, this May marks the end of one chapter of schooling, maybe a transition to the next or into working life or maybe even to retirement. Uh, Whatever comes next, we should celebrate what has been and maybe even most important, the freedom of a break. Yes, rest is important, friends. So I'm going to name several groups of people, and as you hear that which best describes you, if you would please stand for us to celebrate you, everyone should just please remain standing until we're done, please. So those graduating from high school or from college, those graduating with advanced degrees, we've got some working on some. Those hoping to advance with... No. (laughs) Those moving from elementary to middle school or from one grade to the next. I know that's lots. Middle school to high school. Those moving uh, from any grade to the next grade. Yes. And of course, we also need to remember the ones who orchestrate all of this. Any of those who are teachers... Any of those who are librarians or support staff, administration, anything like that? And any of those who are parents or grandparents of a student? (laughs) To all of you we say congratulations. Please be seated. Enjoy your summer. Hopefully you get a break. Immediately following worship today, we will have a brief reception in the narthex with cake and some other treats to celebrate our new members and our graduates. You're all invited to join in on that before you depart. And a special thank you to Congregational Life for helping to organize this, as well as specifically to Tony Embler, uh, who is proudly celebrating the graduation of her grandson, Boris, today. Uh, and who help make this celebration a reality. Friends, let us start our worship together by passing the peace, which goes like this. Peace be with you. you. Let's take one moment to pass that peace around us. Church family and friends, good morning. morning. Let us be, put our minds together for our call to worship with this liturgy. Everyone here is unique and special. So bring your talents, gifts, service, and your smiles. And we have work to do beyond Sunday. May our worship today energize us through the week. Help us change we want to see in the world. 
Any kids who are with us and want to head off to Sunday school class are welcome to do so. Miss Alicia's leading out.
The reading today is from Acts first chapter, 15 through 17 and 21 through 26 from the Common English Bible. During this time, the family of believers was a company of about 120 persons. Peter stood among them and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture that was the Holy Spirit announced beforehand through David had to be fulfilled. This was the scripture concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. This happened even though he was one of us and received a share of this ministry. Therefore, we must select one of those who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus lived among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day Jesus was taken away from us. This person must become, along with us, a witness to his resurrection. So they nominated two, Joseph called Barsabas, who also was known as Justice, and Matthias. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's deepest thoughts and desires. Show us clearly which one you have chosen from among these two to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned away to go to his own place. When they cast lots, the lot fell on Matthias. He was added to the 11 apostles. These are the words from our tradition. God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Thanks to you, O God. So I'm not sure what your uh, relationship status is with the church these days, both this church and that big capital C church that exists almost as an idea more than anything. Uh, Likely, given the histories of people that I know in this place, it uh, either has been or is currently labeled as, it's complicated. Um, It's complicated. Uh, Because church has probably been both a source of great belonging and also an equal source of rejection or exclusion. It's part of why you are here, for you came to fellowship at some point in time, setting foot in a church either for the first time in a long time or for the very last time, as if you were giving church one more shot. And I appreciate that. Hey, our our new member class is made up of what I just described, right? And there's lots of very good reasons for this apprehension. You know, the big capital C church really has no one to blame but itself, having drifted so far from values and mission. And we see that same thing everywhere, places like church and public schools and democracy. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah. But if there is anything in a post-pandemic, very chaotic world that we need, it is community. Can I get another amen? Amen. Which so often comes alongside institution, which is a very long four-letter word these days. So at a time in which we need values and community the most, but largely have anemic institutions to lean on, how do we start the process of rebuilding or of reimagining? In the passage for today, the disciples are dealing with such a crisis, for although the resurrection is incredible news, it is also a very anxious moment. First off... If Jesus was resurrected, then that means all that love your neighbor and forgive your enemies and repent and change your life stuff is legit. And now, as his follower, I have to love my neighbor and forgive my enemies and change my life. And that was fine in the abstract, uh, but I don't even know how to do that for real. And neither did they, of course. Thus begins the book of Acts, where they're making stuff up as they go along. 
as we encounter the apostles today, they're scared and they're anxious and they're unsure of what to even do next. And as if all of that weren't enough, they're also shorthanded. You remember that Judas guy, right? Well, he's um, not in the picture anymore, is I guess the nice way to say it. So the apostles respond to this leadership void by calling the first congregational meeting ever. And they bring a slate of new leaders as if an institutional response is their first inclination. Or perhaps a better way to say it is that community is their first inclination. And community, at least it seems to imply in this passage, takes some structure. Now this morning, we're celebrating new members and lifting up the academic achievements of fellow congregants, and we will soon hold prayers close for others, dealing with hardship or feeling joy, all of which are functions of this community. And as the apostles knew, that doesn't really sustain itself without some substance to it, without some structure on which to hang all of those relationships. New members mean that we become something new because they bring new stuff and we should change because of it. That's what inclusion means. Belonging isn't what happened up here just a few minutes ago. It's something that we nurture over time. It comes with that dedication and commitment and a healthy amount of risk because, my friends, community is risky just like love and friendship. But you, each and every one of you, deserve that kind of community. You need it. We need it. And it doesn't just happen. We need the foundation for it. So how do we nurture it into an intergenerational space with brand new people and folks who've been around, around here a long time, plus people coming from all different kinds of church backgrounds and communities and bringing all of their gifts and assumptions with them? Well, there's no handbook, I can tell you that. We have to learn to let the Spirit guide us. That is exactly what these new apostles are doing Learning to live in an inconsistent and changing atmosphere that is life in the Spirit. That's the whole book of Acts. A collection of stories about the apostles nurturing belonging among themselves and with others, every single other. Discovering new space in their hearts and being courageous enough to witness God's love permeating all of the places they had been taught were separate from God. All of that through following the Spirit's call. It isn't easy work. The apostles are constantly fumbling their way through the Spirit's agitation, looking foolish because they denounce all of the stuff that they previously lauded as important, even the things they called holy. They have no manual either. There's no Robert's Rules. There's no Constitution or bylaws. No handbook at all for any guidance. What they do have is trust in the Spirit. Well, they have trust in the Spirit and a handful of straws. Now, that's not exactly the method I'd recommend in us uh, for our leadership development, though it does sometimes feel like we're flipping a coin, right? But there's something going on here that I think we need to pay attention to. After all, who thinks of committee work or meetings or leadership as spiritual development, even spiritually guided at all? The early church called itself the ekklesia, which in Greek literally means the called out ones, but is primarily used as a political term for a local governance board, maybe something close to a homeowners association or a PTA. Now, maybe that's not what comes to mind when you think of world-altering institutions. But think again. 
when we remember the charge given to us as followers of Jesus, that we are called out, the called out ones, to be a foretaste of the kingdom of God, then the structures that we build together must reflect that called outness. Look, I know that here at Fellowship, leadership is sometimes seen as a burden. Setting an agenda, organizing the sock drive, taking minutes. (laughs) Yuck. And yet, that is the very work that provides the soil where our spiritual growth can happen. How is it that you think your generosity is lived out into the world, making it to the people who need the socks? You bring them in here, those people aren't here. They get to the people who need socks. How do you think that we have a building to experience the beauty and challenge of worship or the importance of a small group on Ignatian spirituality or a choir room to sing our faith? How is the piano in tune, or let's say mostly in tune? Yeah. How is it in tune, or uh, the garden producing food, or the name tags out front each week so you can remember the name of the person that you sit by the same every time, every week, right? <laughs> How are we giving away tens of thousands of dollars in this past year alone to some really important and groundbreaking efforts at change here in our city? Well, we are in part because of the foundational work of leadership, the roots of spiritual growth and social change, the good soil from which we can nurture belonging both here first and then out there, a foretaste of the kingdom. It's easy to get lost in the drudgery of leadership, another task to do, another list to check off, another meeting Sheesh, another meeting. Like, listen, I have to go to all of them, (laughs) y'all. And yeah, we probably have too many meetings. I mean, let me just say from the pulpit to all of our current leaders uh, that it's okay to not have a monthly meeting if you don't have anything to meet about. Okay? (laughs) Can I get another amen? (laughs) That was the loudest one yet. You can skip them if there's nothing to do but recap, okay? The point is not meetings. The point is the work. And that can get done a lot of ways. See, when I read this passage, I could see how people might come away with the sense that the apostles were just leaving things up to chance. They cast lots, right? It's a roll of the dice. Leadership given to who literally drew the short straw which reinforces the idea that leadership is for the suckers who've been guilted into doing it. But friends, that is the opposite of what is happening in this passage. In this passage, they're engaging in the presence of the Spirit. They're listening and they're discerning. They're praying together. And yes, they're using a tangible method to decide, but that's not really the focus to me. Because look at what they infuse that with. Make it clear to us, Lord, who this is. We'll spin the bottle. Make it clear to us. The focus ought to be on their collective decision about what was needed The raising up of people from among them who weren't just warm bodies to fill some slot on a chart, but actually had the skills and the experience needed. And doing so as spiritual development. The question isn't, are you available for leadership? Do you have time in the schedules all of us have that are all too busy? The question is, are you courageous enough? For leadership? Are you willing to take on a task and let the Spirit agitate you and your work, building the soil in which the kingdom can grow? Where do you take part in making this a place of inclusion and compassion? For we need places 
that provide a solid foundation for growing the kingdom of inclusion and grace and justice. Can we agree on that? In a chaotic world that also, by the way, has no manual. And this work takes all of us engaged with the Spirit, using the gifts that we have for one another, with one another, as we seek to move into that chaos as a community. For I think by now we have all learned we can't do this alone, can we? So, welcome new members. And welcome to you who've already been here to this place where the Spirit is ready to make something new of us every single time that we meet, starting right now. And in a world where the same old, same old is literally killing us, thank God for that. Amen. Well, in our community prayer time, I want to start out with a couple of joys. I heard that Sue Bentley has a rock star, track star. She did great in her track meet, I heard. So that is a joy for that. Hooray for them. I think they were, she placed third in this big competition. So, Sue, we're celebrating with you, okay? <laughs> yoo -hoo, yeah. And also... Um, our friend Rob here, it, he expressed a joy to me that his daughter Jessica is moving here. He is so thankful, Jessica, that you are moving here to be, get to be close with his daughter. So we're, we celebrate that joy for you, both of you. May you be happy here. And now I have some prayers of concerns for all of you. Um, dear friend, our dear sweet friend, uh, Julie and I, and some of you, uh, the Reverend Paul Maxey died, uh, we think he had a, a heart attack Thursday, and so he is the husband of Reverend Rosemary, and we pray that he's gonna, he was a beloved man, and he's going to be missed by friends and family and his community, so we, we pray for all of us who are going to miss them very much. Robert Burton? Your mom is in entering rehab, Loetta, right? So, yeah, okay, starting rehab from a stroke, so we are going to be lifting her up. And also, yeah, we, yes, we've had a number of companions that have had surgeries. Um, Eileen Werner, uh, recovery from her, her liver surgery, and Linda Maloney, also surgery. Uh, Kathy Swain. And Sharon Pyle will be going to MD Anderson for a rare uh, cancer that she has. Please continue to pray for Bill Young and his, as he uh, sp spends time with dear friends and just peace for him. And our friend Donna Rabel, as many of you know, has been struggling with a lot of health issues. And, you know, now it's time, you know, we know people, we may be in, uh, have people closest where it's time to really think about that quality of life. And so prayers for Don and for many of those who are trying to come to that decision. So let's take this time now to close your eyes if you're comfortable and pray silently. Let's lift up our collective prayers and energy together. God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Now, God, just as a mother hen huddles her baby chicks within her protective feathers, so you desire that all of us, your children, would gather together in your love. For love that is shared is stronger, making us more resilient in difficult times. It is as a buffer against the swirling winds of chaos. So God, 
scurry us into the cover of your wings as we look out for one another and as we pray together this prayer. Our creator who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you reign in the power that is love, now and always. Amen. Friends, communion comes with a gluten-free option, and should you need that, just tell the servers as you come forward. All of the cups contain juice, not wine, and are in reusable glass, which we sterilize after every service. These are ways that we make sure everyone is welcome at this table. We take down as few barriers as possible, and we are responsible with our resources. Let us prepare ourselves for communion with this hymn. Those who are assisting with communion, please come forward. Here at this table, we remember what became a central ritual for the followers of the resurrected Jesus. This was a symbolic meal, the Eucharist from the Greek for thanksgiving, that marked the lives of the earliest post-Easter communities and what became what we eventually called the church. Though it has taken on all different kinds of meaning over the centuries, and I'm sure there have been thousands of meetings about it, here at this table, we see a vision of God's kingdom a tiny taste of how God would have us live with a seat at the table for everyone. If you wish to take communion, you are welcome to do so this morning. Here we remember that Jesus gathered with his community, broke the bread, and he shared it with them. And he said, take and eat. Eating this bread is like fellowship with the body of Christ. It is given for you. Then he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he poured it, and he shared it with them, and he said, take and drink. In this cup, we seal a new covenant of hope and peace and trust, as if it were made in the essence of my life. And each time that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do so in memory of him, and we reseal that covenant all over again. So let us share now a taste of the hope and the justice and the grace that God has for all of us. Let us remember what it means to be Easter people together.
Now, I have no idea where this stuff ended up the last two weeks, but... <laughs> I'm looking at you, Morrison. I have someone in here that gives me nonverbal permission to make adjustments. I'm not going to call that person out. That person is a good friend, though. All right. <clears throat> All of the news about the life of this church is available in our weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for at UCCTulsa.org or in the North X. You can also give online at our website via the QR code on your bulletin or by donation in the giving box at the back of the sanctuary anytime during worship to support the work of this church both inside and beyond our walls. Church family, let us give thanks for these gifts in prayer. Generous God, as we learn generosity in a world that teaches selfishness, bless our giving that it may be a blessing to others. As we learn trust in a world that teaches individualism, bless our giving that it may lead us to community. As we learn sacrifice in a world that teaches greed, Bless our giving that it may remind us all who we have been given. Amen. If you are able, please stand. My friends, let us go out into this beautiful day. Go now in peace and pray for peace and wage a little peace and love one another, every single other. Amen. Make some room for the flame. <laughs>